Podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, my name is Kelly Tebow, and I'm with the New Jersey Center for Tourette Syndrome and Associated Disorders. I will be your organizer for this evening and would like to welcome you to our webinar on what a difference a school nurse can make. Thank you all for joining us. Before I have my colleague introduce the speaker for tonight, I'm going to cover housekeeping items with you. All participants are muted. If you have a question, please type it in the bottom of your question box and click send. You may send as many questions during the webinar. However, we will have Dr. Hart Key answer the questions at the end of his presentation. We will get to as many queries as time allows. And you, in addition to tonight's presenter, is available to take your questions on the Wednesday webinar blog, which is accessed from our homepage under the heading Programs. This blog will be monitored for the next seven days. Feel free to look and post questions as often as you like. Answers will be archived for future reference. If you missed part of the presentation or would like to just watch it again, an archived version will be posted to our website shortly. We value your input, and in order to expand the webinar experience, we need everyone attending to fill out the survey when you exit the webinar. The New Jersey Center for Tourette Syndrome and Associated Disorders and its directors and employees assume no responsibility for the accuracy, completeness, objectivity, or usefulness of the information presented. We do not endorse any recommendation or opinion made by any member or physician, nor do we advocate for any treatment. You are responsible for your own medical decisions. Now... I'm going to turn over the introductions of our speaker to Martha Butterfield, the webinar coordinator of NJCTS. Marty? Thank you, Kelly. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar. Before I get into the details about tonight's program, I would like to make a short announcement pertaining to those of you who requested professional development credit. Your professional development certificate will be emailed to you. If you haven't received it by February 9th, please let us know. Now, tonight's webinar is a special one for the New Jersey Center of Tourette Syndrome. January is the 10th anniversary of our webinar series. Kelly and I are proud to have been able to offer programming on a wide range of issues affecting families and educators dealing with not just Tourette syndrome, but a broad range of topics relevant to raising and educating kids with neurological issues. This special occasion was the perfect opportunity for us to recognize one of the best partners educators and families can have, and that's the school nurse. The title of this webinar is no joke, they do make a difference. To present on this topic, we've invited one of our favorite and most accomplished presenters, Dr. Graham Hartke, who I will introduce in just a moment. Tonight, we have attendees from all across the country. Many of you have never attended one of our webinars before. I want to extend a special welcome to those of you discovering us for the first time, and a special thank you to those who attend regularly. I encourage you all to visit our webinar archive for listings of all of our webinars covering a wide variety of subjects involving kids, families, siblings, educators, medical professionals. Going forward, you will receive announcements of our upcoming schedule and I invite you to join us again. The next webinar for us will be February 21st when we will present our 100th webinar. This is called the TS Puzzle, How Do the Pieces fix? Fit? How Do the Pieces Fit? Sorry. And it'll be presented by another one of our outstanding presenters, Dr. Marty Franklin from the University of Pennsylvania. Now to the introduction of tonight's presenter, Dr. Graham Hartke. Dr. Hartke is a valued friend of NJCTS, and this is his sixth webinar in our series. As with all of our webinars, his are available for free download on our website. He is a graduate of Rutgers University, where he received his master's and doctorate in school psychology. He also did clinical training at the Tourette Syndrome program and completed a concentration in sports psychology. 
He regularly presents workshops and in-service trainings to parents, schools, and other groups on a range of topics such as TS, social skills, anxiety, bullying, cyber safe safety, problem solving, and school crisis management. Dr. Hartke has also developed multiple clinical and school-based programs on social skills, school-wide social emotional learning, positive behavioral support, and mental skills training for athletes and performing artists. Along with his private practice work, Dr. Hartke has worked as a special education teacher, school psychologist, and a supervisor at Shepherd Schools in Morristown, New Jersey for over 10 years. Dr. Hartke, welcome back. We are so pleased to have you here. And now I'm going to turn tonight's program over to you. Well, thank you, Marty. And uh, I'd like to thank you, Marty. And I'd like to welcome everyone tonight to the webinar. Um, and I'd like to give a special thanks to Faith, Kelly, and Marty at NJCTS. Um, like they said, this is my sixth webinar, and I've um, ha enjoyed all of them so far. And um, I'm very excited to be presenting again tonight um, to a very special group that is often um, not given enough credit for what an essential role they play in all students' lives, but especially students with Tourette syndrome. Um, I also wanted to welcome everyone that's joined tonight that's not a school nurse, that um, either, either is a, a parent, a family member uh, of someone with, just someone who's interested, or any other kind of educator who might just be um, joining the webinar. Welcome. So tonight's presentation will cover uh, a range of topics, and since we're limited by um, our you know, time constraints in the webinar, I won't go into super detail of any one area, but I'm gonna to try to give a pretty good overview to present um, a guide for um, school nurses for Tourette's syndrome and cover some essential areas. So we're gonna go over Tourette's syndrome generally and cover some associated disorders. We're, and then we're gonna talk a little about the challenges faced by students who have Tourette's syndrome. And then we're gonna spend a little bit of time just talking about um, what makes, uh, what a difference a school nurse makes. and um, the lead framework that school nurses really are leaders out there in the community and in schools, especially um, for students with Tourette syndrome. And last, we'll cover some strategies and tips for both families and schools. A lot of these apply to um, school nurses, but there are also um, tips that could apply to anyone who uh, works with or has someone with Tourette syndrome in their family. Okay, so to get started, we're gonna do uh, go over the basics of what Tourette's syndrome is. So Tourette's syndrome is a neurological disorder. Um, it's characterized by tics, and often people uh, might not say they have Tourette's syndrome, they might just say they have tics, um, but tics are the hallmark of Tourette's syndrome, and they are sudden, rapid, recurrent, non-rhythmic, repetitive motor movements or vocalizations. And for all intents and purposes, tics are involuntary, um, and are not something that an individual just wants to do um, and has usually not much control over. And there are two major categories of tics, uh, motor movements or motor tics and vocal. So motor tics are movements and vocal tics are sounds. So with motor and vocal tics, um, they might maybe either simple or complex. Um, and motor tics that are simple involve only a few muscle movements. Um, sounds that are vocal tics that are simple are really just any kind of sound or noise, but not really any kind of words or phrases you would understand. Um, complex uh, motor tics involve multiple groups of muscles and usually some kind of uh, coordinated movements. And complex vocal tics involve words, phrases, syllables, and we're gonna go over a review right now. Oh, next slide. Um, so just for all intents and purposes, tic disorders have, there are three major diagnostic, um, there are ways to diagnose tic disorders right now, as far as the DSM-5 is concerned. We have Tourette's disorder, which involves having both motor and vocal tics. We have also um, persistent motor or vocal tic disorder. 
So an individual might just have motor tics, so they would have a persistent or chronic motor tic disorder. Or they might just have vocal tics, and they would have a persistent or chronic vocal tic disorder. For all intents and purposes, um, Tourette disorder and uh, a persistent motor or vocal tic disorder are not really much different. It's really just a way of describing what types of tics someone has had. So someone might have Tourette disorder and have had a vocal tic one time in their life when they were eight years old and never again, but because they've had vocal and motor tics at any point in their life, they meet the criteria for um, Tourette disorder. Um, and really the way it's treated and um, experienced, it doesn't really make too much difference. It's more of a label. Um, the bottom uh, diagnostic criteria I wanna just cover for a second is provisional tic disorder. That's important. Um, this, a child shows that they have tics or displays tics does not mean it's going to develop into a more chronic um, or long-lasting tic disorder, either Tourette syndrome or Tourette disorder or persistent motor vocal tic disorder. Um, a lot of kids will develop tics that go away. They call them, you know, transient tics, and it could last for a few weeks and then disappear, never to return again. Um, so it really, it's, a child really needs to have tics for a good amount of time to get a firm uh, diagnosis of a tic disorder. Um, if they're displaying tics and they haven't had tics very long, um, doctors usually will start off with a provisional tic disorder. So here's some examples of motor tics, and I have them divided into simple and complex. If you look at the top left corner here, um, eye blinking and eye movements particularly are some of the first when, when a child develops tics. Um, children usually start developing tics between the ages of five and ten, um, and often if they start out as motor tics, not always, but often um, the tics start in the facial area, and um, very frequently it starts with some type of eye movement or eye blinking. Um, like I said, it's not in every case; it doesn't have to happen that way. It's just often. Um, but really, anything can be a tic that you can imagine, and probably has been, and probably is. So. These are just some common ones, but any type of movement really could turn into a tick. Um, so it can, ex it can range from an eye blink, which can be very distracting if a kid's trying to read or focus, um, all the way to really forceful um, arm, drinks, uh, arm jerks and uh, leg jerks, um, kicks. Um, particularly painful are um, ticks that involve the neck area, um, you know, a lot of individuals with really forceful neck tics have a lot of pain in their neck area and their, and, and their head. Um, so head jerks, um, neck movements, shoulder movements, they're all, all within the, the purview of simple tics um, until they become more sequenced and purposeful movements and they become what we call complex tics. So a bunch of um, complex tics that are, are common here would be um, uh, spinning or gyrating and bending, um, jumping or skipping, um, and touching people and objects. Um, definitely occur a good amount with um, children that have complex motor tics, but really any kind of movements can be a complex tic. Um, recently, I, or not really recently, but a few years ago, um, I had a bunch of individuals I was working with of, of ranging between the ages of, let's say six to um, their mid twenties and um, a bunch of them had tics that involved rolling on the floor and, and doing headstands. So I don't have headstands on here, but that could be a complex motor tic and that could be an example of that. Moving on to vocal tics. Vocal tics that are simple and often if vocal tics are the first tic a child experiences, they will experience a simple vocal tic like throat clearing, sniffling, coughing. Um, and those three particularly are, are, are pretty common, especially with um, um, the first tick a child might have. Um, and often they might start occurring after a child um, is sick in the winter or they have a cold and then the sniffling or coughing just doesn't go away and it seems just a little bit different than a regular cough. Um, doesn't have to happen as a result or, or after someone is, is sick, but, but oftentimes it'll, um, you know, parents might just think they have allergies or something, um, a cold went through the school and they just, they're just coughing. But when it doesn't go away and it, it seems to happen at a slightly different, um, maybe a different rate or different um, pattern, you know, it's, it's sometimes um, doctors will pick up that might be a tick developing. Um, 
Now, some really potentially disruptive um, vocal tics, um, really all of them could be, but it's, it's particularly yelling and screaming um, in a classroom setting could be very, very disruptive to um, a classroom environment and um, really difficult for all individuals involved, particularly the individual with tics, um, to just get through um, a time period where they might have really um, loud vocal tics. Complex vocal tics involve using more syllables, words, or phrases. Um, it could be anything from just a speech atypicality, so change in tone or volume, um, to a specific phrase. Um, sometimes the phrases can make no sense at all. Sometimes they could be um, just seem irrelevant to the situation. Someone might you know, wonder why they're saying that. Um, oftentimes, um, kids will whisper a uh, phrase to themselves. Um, so they're not saying it really loud, but they're, they're kind of saying it to themselves quietly. Um, and on the right-hand side, I do want to point out um, copa, uh, coparelia um, over here. And that's a vocal, a complex vocal tick where someone might shout obscenities or socially taboo phrases. Now, oftentimes in the media, this is sensationalized. And there's a lot of uh, misinformation out there that everyone that has Tourette syndrome uh, um, has coparelia and it's a hallmark of the disorder, but really only about 10 to 12 percent of individuals that have Tourette syndrome at any point in their life have some form of coparelia. And often it's it's pretty quiet. It might be a mumbling uh, a, a bad word. Um, but in cases where it does exist, it can be extremely disruptive for kids and and even adults that have um, this tick and it can it can lead to some really difficult situations. Um, sometimes in feel a really strong urge to say the worst thing possible um, in a situation, even though they know it's wrong and they don't want to say it, that um, it could have that pull. Not everyone experiences that, but just some people have told me that that's what they feel. Um, also, some individuals might have echolalia and paulalia um, over here on the right. And echolalia is when you repeat others. And this can be particularly difficult in a school setting or classroom setting where um, students think that someone with tics is um, mocking them or imitating them um, and it could lead to just some you know a lot of confusion and um, possible um, you know just some difficulty in the classroom setting or school setting so it's just some characteristics about tics that are important to point out um, and this is really essential here tics are generally experienced as irresistible so kids cannot stop the urge to tick. Um, it's basically analogous to if I was to tell you to stop the urge to sneeze or stop the itchy feeling you have on your arm uh, before you want to scratch it. You can't just wish it away. It's a physical sensation that occurs um, and it's really hard to resist doing the action to make the urge go away. Um, and we'll explain about that in a minute. Um, the other thing that's really essential with ticks is that they wax and wane naturally over time. And this means that they increase in all kinds of areas. So they might increase in how many different ticks there are at one time. There might be five ticks. There might be 10 ticks in April. And then in September, there might be one different tick. So they go up and down. In, in April, there might be really, really severe forceful ticks. And then in September, there might be very few ticks and they're not very forceful at all. Um, so ticks naturally wax and wane over time, which means that um, even if someone they're not, you know, having any kind of treatment, medical or other or behavioral, um, just by nature they will they will go up and down in their intensity in different areas. Um, ticks often are exacerbated by fatigue and stress, but also by um, excitement. And anything in the environment has the potential to influence a tick. Um, not, it doesn't always uh, influence it, but in different cases, something in the environment could be influencing a tick, could be um, causing the individual to feel the sensation that they need to tick. And it's not that stress causes ticks or excitement causes ticks. It's more that it makes it more likely that they're going to occur. Um, it's a little bit different than just saying it causes it. So usually kids can anticipate the ticks. They know when they're, they're coming if they're made aware of it. But in my experience, often when I talk to kids, they really, most of them are not paying attention to it. They're not really looking for the, the, the sign, uh, which we call a premonetary sensory urge or a tick signal. So before a tick occurs, 
most individuals experience what we call a pre-monetary urge. It's a sensory urge. And basically that urge um, feels similar to the sensation you might have if you were feeling itchy or if you feel like you were gonna sneeze. And the tick perf uh, performs the function of relieving that unpleasant sensation. So imagine that the urge is like the itchy sensation and the tick is scratching the itch where it temporarily makes it feel better, but then after they stop scratching, the itch comes back. So that's, a, that's one of the better ways to do, describe for individuals that don't have ticks what the process is like. Now, not all individuals experience pre-monetary urges or report them or are aware of them. Um, so it's often something in, in treatment as a psychologist that we work on kind of increasing awareness. So for all intents and purposes, for school professionals and families, ticks are involuntary. Often they're described as being voluntary and involuntary, somewhere in the middle. Um, and people usually have, for many ticks, have some ability to hold back or resist them. But in the long term, they can't. So imagine being really itchy all over your body and telling yourself, I'm not going to scratch the itch. I'm not going to scratch the itch. But eventually, you're going to scratch the itch because it's just going to become too much not to scratch it. And oftentimes, kids <coughs> will hold their ticks in for long periods of time or for what you know we might think is a really long period of time, um, which might be the entire school day, it might be for the morning or a class period or for 10 minutes. And um, sometimes kids report when they get home from school, they have like a burst of tick activity because they're holding their ticks back all day. It also can be extremely distracting to hold back ticks. So imagine being in class and trying to listen to a teacher uh, you know, present a lesson, um, to focus on a test and feel like you're suppressing ticks. Um, you know, the best analogy is imagine you feel like you had to sneeze the entire time you were taking an exam and you were trying not to pay attention to the feeling that you had to sneeze and hold it in um, and still focus on your work. So kids with, with uh, ticks sometimes have a really tough time and um, a tough experience um, just kind of focusing in class and, and managing their ticks. So most most cases of tick disorders are mild, but they can range from mild to very severe. So someone might be, um, someone in your family that you've known for years might have a small tick in their eye that you've noticed for the last 35, 40 years, and, and it really causes them no problems in their life. Um, there might be a kid in, that in a, your school that has a very small you know, facial tick, doesn't bother them, no one ever brings it up, they seem to be doing fine in school, um, not a problem. It can range from that level of ticks to very severe, where where kids are um, have to you know be out of school for long periods of time um, and take many different medications. Um, sometimes uh, need to be bedridden for a while um, or um, experience a lot of physical pain. So while most cases are mild, it can range to severe. So just be aware that you know if someone says they have um, Tourette syndrome or a tick disorder, it doesn't really tell you a lot just from that title of how severe their symptoms are. Also, it changes over time, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. So someone might have really mild ticks now, but they might have gone through a really rough period a few years ago or months ago um, with severe, a severe bout of ticks. Um, and also, just it's really important, I mentioned before, that the media sensationalizes really severe ticks and cop uh, coprolalia, so the cursing, uh, obscene gestures, um, is something we call um, a motor tick version of coprolalia. Um, and the media really sensationalizes that. And it's important for anyone that's educated about Tourette's and to know that it's not the disorder where people just curse. It's, it's something that only happens in 12% of individuals at any point of their life. Um, another area I think is important just for nurses to know is that um, individuals with tics often have um, some difficulty with sleep. It can range from very little difficulty to extreme difficulty with sleep. Um, and sometimes kids might come to school really tired uh, maybe late, um, and this could lead to maybe even some school refusal because kids just, it's too much to kind of get up in the morning and go to school. Um, some kids will report that their ticks really aren't waking them up in the middle of the night while they're sleeping, but they have some trouble settling down at the end of the night and they're ticking before they go to sleep. Um, but it can really vary because some uh, children can be woken up in their sleep. Um, so it really depends. Like a lot of disorders out there, um, there's no 
one known cause for uh, Tourette syndrome, similar to autism, but there are currently many, many studies out there, um, particularly the genetic study at Rutgers um, is, is one that's close by to where um, we're doing this webinar. And um, they're looking for genetic links and other kind of biological um, links to um, Tourette syndrome. And you know they've made some recent uh, findings and breakthroughs that are, are pretty astounding. And they've had a lot of we've had a lot of families in the area and from all over the country come and um, donate um, to the program. But for all intents and purposes, for for this uh, for school nurses, uh, we don't have one single cause. There's there's a genetic link which the studies have found, um, but it's not in every case, um, but there seems to be some kind of genetic link. Um, and similar brain areas um, to OCD and ADHD are, um, or brain areas that are involved with OCD and ADHD are also involved um, with Tourette syndrome. Um, there's also something I wanna point out um, that nurses might hear about, which is PANDAS, uh, which is something that um, occurs when, when individuals have a strep infection. And I will definitely want to emphasize that um, and remind everyone that I'm a psychologist. I'm not a, a medical doctor um, and or a medical researcher. So um, if you'd like more information about pandas, that you know I, I, I can give some general information, but I'm not. Um, this isn't my specialty area as far as the research on pandas. But what pandas is, and it's disputed by um, those in the medical community. Some people are really on board with it, and others dispute um, how much of a, a real thing it is. Um, but in the case of pandas. Uh, when an individual has strep in their body, um, they, tip, they could develop some kind of OCD or uh, tick symptoms or anxiety uh, while, you know, as a result of the strep. And the hallmark with, with pandas, as far as I have um, learned from, you know, medical professionals, and is generally that when someone takes antibiotics, the symptoms go away, and it does not cause Tourette syndrome. Um, it's kind of its own isolated um, condition. And like I said, this is a, a hot topic in the medical community. Um, so some doctors or, or medical professionals are um, more on board with it than others as, as that it's a real thing. Um, but in my uh, professional experience, I have had, I've had worked with families that do get very concerned about it in the school setting. Um, one individual, um, one parent I remember particularly a few years ago was very concerned um, because other students in the school had uh, strep throat, and um, this individual's child had um, ticks, um, pretty severe ticks, and they were worried that um, they didn't want their child to be around strep, um, strep infection. Um, and in that case, you know, really, it's someone that has uh, Tourette syndrome or, and severe ticks, um, being around strep is not going to cause them to have ticks. They already have ticks, and um, most likely will not. Um, you know, cause much more discomfort. So it's it's a fear that I don't think is 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 something that um, anyone really has to worry too much about. Um, but sometimes you might hear about it in school, um, and um, to, uh, usually the hallmark of pandas is if, when someone takes antibiotics and the strep is um, treated, that the symptoms subside. Um, okay, one other thing I want to talk about is just that. Um, just some general numbers. Um, Tourette syndrome is found widely throughout the world in diverse ethnic and racial groups. Um, that's important because it's really it really shows that it's um, spread out evenly across the world for the most part. Um, it's not just something that occurs in a few isolated populations. Um, also, one out of one every one out of every hundred student uh, school age children have Tourette syndrome or some form of tick disorder. And I would say that number is probably a little bit. Um, it's probably more than one out of every hundred have some form of tick disorder at any point in their life. But um, there's a lot of kids in your school that might that potentially have ticks or might develop ticks uh, more than you or might be aware of. Um, so that's good information to just keep in the back of your mind. Now, typically, those school nurses that work in elementary schools, this is particularly important. Um, usually, between the ages of five and ten, I said this before, but just to highlight it. Um, are the ages that most children start experiencing ticks and they, they start developing. Um, and really most, I would say if you're, if kids that have Tourette disorder, usually by the age of 10 and 11, they're gonna have some kind of diagnosis. 
Um, sometimes it does take a few years to get a firm diagnosis. A lot of times pediatricians um, are hesitant at first, I think, to um, jump right to Tourette syndrome, and rightfully so, because it could be just um, a transient tick that will go away. Um, you don't want to alarm parents, you know, too early. Um, keep an eye on it. Um, sometimes ticks are really mild, and um, parents really, you know, no one really is is thinking that there's much going on, and they want to get a diagnosis. Um, so sometimes kids will go through many doctors, and or, or it'll just take many years to get a diagnosis. But um, between the ages of five and ten is when most symptoms begin for most individuals. Um, and typically it begins with the eye blink like I talked about before. Um, something I'll bring up on down here that I think is important to bring up is kids will often ask um, and parents, you know, will it go away? Will this, will, is it going to stop ever? Um, and usually we, we don't ever want to uh, someone's hope because in reality that there's a, a chance that, that an angel's ticks will really diminish greatly that, you know, they could even almost basically go away where there's really aren't many ticks into adulthood. Um, oftentimes about a third of individuals really have very little ticks by the time they're adults. Um, another third have symptoms about as, you know, a little bit more uh, milder symptoms than they had in, in as, as children, but they still have some ticks. And about a third have ticks that are about um, the same as they have in late adolescence. Um, so it's not that, it's not that ticks will, um, go away um oops turn this off um for sure but it's definitely a chance that they're going to diminish and um treatments keep on coming out and there's definitely more options um you know out there for working with individuals with ticks so let's talk a little about diagnosis and treatment um because as a school nurse you will likely be asked some questions about this and it's good for you to know um so to diagnose Tourette syndrome, it needs to be um, diagnosed by a medical doctor. Um, a physical and a neurological exam need to happen um, to rule out other conditions, um, seizure disorders, um, brain injury, um, and, a, and really run a whole panel of tests to rule out other conditions before um, concluding that there's some form of tick disorder occurring. Um, currently, medication is the, is the main standard treatment for, for treating ticks, particularly ticks that are you know intense enough that someone might seek treatment for them, um, and there we don't have one medication that's like an anti-tick medication out there. Um, often it's antihypertensive medications or uh, neuroleptics like um, atypical and typical antipsychotics. Um, often these medications, particularly the um, typical antipsychotics, um, have really severe side effects for some kids, um, and you know they're often the drugs that need to be used when, when kids have really severe tics. Um, and the side effects can include drowsiness, weight gain, um, and sometimes kids might need to be out of school for a little while, whether um, you know, getting put on a medication or taken off a medication. So it's something to really be aware of that um, you know, when kids are on medications for tics that there are side effects. Um, Non-medical treatment, which is what I do as a psychologist, uh, includes behavioral treatment. Um, we have something called habit reversal or CBIT, um, which involves um, basically increasing awareness of individual tics, um, looking for the tic signals or premonitory urges, and then incorporating a competing response for that tic or some kind of movement or, um, or vocalization or um, just something that is a competing physical response to the tick. So when you do the computer response, you can't really do the tick. Um, it's a, it's a, a treatment that really has helped a lot of individuals. Um, it does not involve medication, has little to no side effects, and um, is something to you know, consider for individuals um, looking to work on a tick. The thing with Haversal is that it works on one tick at a time. And you know, really, it's, um, it's a kind of treatment that you know, an individual really needs to be kind of motivated to, to engage in because it's a behavioral treatment. Um, also, non-medical treatment that is very helpful um, includes relaxation and coping skills, um, treatments so of deep breathing, um, and often conducting a functional behavioral assessment and plan, um, kind of looking at different environmental factors and situations that might be exacerbating tics or, um, you know, anything in the environment that could be changed to modify that. Um, and traditional psychological treatment, um, educating individuals and families about ticks goes a long way. 
um, developing coping strategies and working on social skills and also monitoring the medication, especially if it's something a nurse can do if they know a child is taking medication, um, they're going on a, you know, a new med. From the school side of things, you could be, it could be very helpful for you to monitor how they're doing on that medication. So a key for, I, I can't stress this enough, is if you know someone that has Tourette syndrome or you're looking for treatment for Tourette syndrome, it is extremely important to find doctors who specialize in Tourette syndrome. Um, on here, I have, you know, you can contact NJCTS, but if you're outside of New Jersey, you can contact your local Tourette Association of America uh, chapter, um, you know, and just look for doctors, um, neurologists, psychiatrists, and psychologists particularly, um, or other um, uh, behavioral health specialists that's, that, are, that have a specialty in Tourette syndrome. Um, it really goes a long way. Um, also, it's important to note that often treatment for Tourette syndrome involves treating co-occurring conditions. So OCD and ADHD are two common ones, and um, sometimes they are more prominent in the focus of treatment over uh, tics. So just know that you might have a child that has tics, but really the primary focus of treatment might be working on obsessions or um, ADHD or, or another condition. Um, Nurses, I, I put this in here too because sometimes when I do talks, um, people ask about this. And, and since you're health professionals, um, so there are um, like a lot of conditions that we don't have a you know one treatment for or um, just a, a you know a specific tick medication. Um, you know, a lot of individuals and families look for alternative treatments, and there are studies out there on different alternative treatments. Um, doctors might recommend them. Um, some examples might be Botox for, um, let's say if someone has a really strong head and neck tick um, to help with muscle pain. <coughs> um, and there's also something now that it's been researched on a dental appliance. Um, there's some studies going on about that. With all these alternative treatments, you know, it's the kind of thing where it, it could be helpful for, for some people. Um, we just don't have as much as evidence right now to say that it's a standard treatment, um, but it's something that you might hear families talking about um, that they might be looking into. So the big picture is most individuals with tics <laughs> have their own combination of coping strategies, standard treatments, educational combinations, and helpful activities. So when you ask somebody how how do you you know cope with your tics, they don't often just say, well, what I do is I, I take this medication every day and that's it. Oftentimes, they have a bunch of strategies. So in school, kids might be need to chew gum, take breaks, um, have a stress ball. Um, they might go, might or might not have medication or go to talk. Um, oftentimes, there's some kind of educational accommodations um, to help with, you know, maybe extended time on testing or um, allow them to take breaks or preferential seating. Um, and really, this bottom activity is something that a lot of times kids are really locked into um, is are the helpful activities or their interests and hobbies that really help them cope with and um, express how they feel and often um, help with the, the symptoms themselves. Um, there are a lot of kids that I've worked with and I, I know other um, practitioners and, and families of kids with um, Tourette syndrome would say the same. There's a lot of kids out there who, you know, when they're playing their instrument in music or they're in sports that um, they feel like their tics go away, they're not really experiencing them and that's really one of the um, their favorite times is when they're engaged in their their interests or activity. Um, and really, the combination of these activities will change over time as kids change. This is a slide that I've added to my um, talks in the last several years um, of working with a lot of families and, and individuals with with ticks, especially in in schools, outside of schools, um, you know, from different angles you really get a sense that it's important if you're gonna work with an individual with Tourette syndrome or any condition, um, to know where they're at and their, their identity of having tics or being a family member of someone that has tics. Um, really could range from just general awareness that someone is personally aware they have tics. There's a lot of times individuals have pretty strong tics and, and not really always sure if they, they're aware of their tics or, or their impact. Um, the next step, step would be acknowledging that they exist to others, you know, telling people, yeah, I have tics. Sometimes that's a really big step for, for individuals is just to acknowledge it. Um, and I would say the next step after that is to accept it, really kind of own that they have tics and, um, 
you know, kind of feel free to talk about it more with others. And then advocacy is really where someone would is willing to advocate for their needs. Now, I would say that between uh, family members, um, there could be, you know, one parent might be at one stage, another parent might be another stage on the scale um, of, you know, if they have a child with ticks, the, the child um, could be, you know, a teenager and be at barely aware that they have ticks, or they could be six years old and be the biggest advocate for ticks in America and want to, you know, do a speech in front of thousands of people about it. So it really does not matter um, someone's age or even the severity of their symptoms. Everyone's an individual and different. Um, it's just important as a school professional or a family member to really, really take stock of where someone's at um, because it'll influence how you talk to them about it. Some kids and families might not want to say Tourette disorder or Tourette syndrome. That might be stigmatizing for them and they prefer saying um, it's a tick or even tick might be a new word that's kind of stigmatizing. They might want to just say, you know, your movement or your, your twitch. Um, really, I never really feel they have to call it, you know, something they don't want at first. Um, you know, eventually I'd like, as a child aged, I'd like them to know what, you know, really what it's called, but, um, you know, really it's, it's really, every family is a different place of how much they want, um, and are willing to, you know, talk about it. So I don't, this, this talk is really focusing more on ticks. Um, so I, I took out a bunch of my usual slides on associated disorders because you could do a whole webinar on each of these. Um, but it's really important to highlight that often individuals that have ticks, um, especially those that have more significant symptoms, have some kind of co-occurring condition that in many cases is more um, disruptive to their daily life um, than the ticks themselves. Um, and they're often the targets of what treatment. So I might see someone in my practice um, who has ticks, but I'm treating them for OCD um, exclusively, basically, I'm not really working on the ticks because the ticks are very mild and not causing problems. Um, so here are some of the most frequently occurring co associated disorders, obsessive compulsive, ADHD, non-OCD anxiety disorder, so panic disorder, general uh, anxiety disorder, social anxiety disorder, separation anxiety disorder for younger ch children, um, and learning disabilities. Now, uh, what I will say here is that um, Obsessive compulsive disorder really occurs in about 60 to 70% of cases of Tourette syndrome. Um, and oftentimes we have obsessions, which are the worry thoughts and the compulsions, which are the ritual, uh, ritualistic behaviors that neutralize the obsessive thoughts in that model. Um, and in that case, a lot of times the compulsions or the behaviors can be very hard to distinguish between a tick. Um, sometimes we even, with some kids, we'll call them tick pulsions or compul ticks um, because they really have a component of um, the kid can't really distinguish between if it's a physical sensation like a tick signal that they're you know kind of relieving with the the movement or there's some kind of worry behind it um, an obsessive worry that and, and sometimes it's just a mix and oftentimes kids with OCD and ticks um, tend to have um, so, you know, basically a sense, instead of a, a specific worry, it's, it's a feeling that something is just not right, um, and that's why they're doing it. So some, someone who just has OCD without ticks, they're more likely to have a contamination fear and have a specific fear um, linked to their ritual, where someone with ticks um, and OCD together, they could have that as well. Um, but oftentimes, um, individuals with ticks, especially kids, will tell you that they, you know, they just feel like something's not right. Um, and it's not always as specific. Sometimes it is, but not always. Um, okay. Um, ADHD, I just want to point out is, um, the rates here are, 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 is a big gap between 21 and 90%. Um, and oftentimes, um, it's, it's difficult to determine whether a kid is distracted because of ticks or ADHD. Um, and learning disabilities, what I want to point out is that a lot of kids with ticks have really bad handwriting. Um, and might need um, academic accommodations, um, and they might have reading disability or writing disability. So there are a lot of other associated conditions, um, autism spectrum disorders, um, particularly can co-occur with tics, um, and sometimes it's difficult to distinguish between stereotypic behaviors and tic movements. Often, um, one way to kind of tell a difference is that um, stereotypic movements are a little bit more positive reinforcing or positive reinforcing in general uh, or pleasurable 
Um, so if someone's arm flapping, if they have um, ASD, it might just be more of an enjoyable behavior. Whereas in the, the in ticks, a tick is more negatively reinforcing um, the premonitory urge. So the tick relieves an unpleasant sensation where the serotypic behavior um, basically is pleasant to, to engage in itself. Um, and something I want to point out here that can be particularly um, disruptive is, is if kids have rage attacks or rage disorders um, along with ticks. It doesn't occur in all cases. Um, about 12% uh, might have you know, rage attacks, but it can be very disruptive to home and school environments. Um, and it does occur in some groups of kids. So challenges faced by TS students. The teacher doesn't know the kid, the student has TS. That is a really, I put that first because that's, that's a really tough one. Um, missing days of school, bullying, teasing, um, isolation, substitute teachers can be, you know, a nightmare for someone with, with ticks if they really don't know why a student is, you know, making sounds or movements in the classroom. Um, so, oop, I missed my slide up here. Um, another, you know, group of challenges faced by um, students with Tourette syndrome are um, really kind of just worrying about um, what others are going to think in their classroom if they tick. A lot of times I have kids, you know, talk to me about how um, they get very upset if, they, if someone asks them why they're doing that. You know, it might seem like a simple question for a kid to ask, like, why are you doing that? Why do you keep sniffle, sniffling with your nose? Why do you keep banging um, your arm on the desk? Um, and just simple, sometimes simple questions like that can be really difficult for kids um, to deal with. And some challenges faced by schools um, is, is if you have a kid in your classroom with Tourette syndrome, um, it creates real um, challenges sometimes in the classroom environment, um, especially if it's disrupted to the entire classroom. You know, teachers often ask, is this fair to the other students if it's disruptive? Students could be upset, parents could be upset. I've, I've been in situations where um, students had, a student has had tics where they, it involves other people where they need to go over and touch them um, and you know, almost started some fights. Um, you know, sometimes um, schools had difficulty if, with the tics and they might think it, it could be an excuse for the kid to get out of work and if that's fair. Um, and sometimes the student will just tell everyone they're doing it on purpose. Um, and it's not a tick, even though from, from a professional standpoint, it seems like a tick. Um, and that, that could just complicate the situation more. It's possible a kid might be trying to save face and, and not admit that they're having a tick. So if that seemed a little bit quick, I apologize, but I tried to you know, put a good amount of information in the first part. Um, but really, I want to focus now on school nurses and your leadership role in the school in general. Um, with any student with any kind of disability, but particularly with ticks and Tourette syndrome. So just I want to point out here that um, school nurses are the number two provider of mental health services in a school. So um, there was a big study done by SAMHSA and basically school nurses are not always thought of as mental health providers, but you are the number two health, mental health provider in schools in America. So you're a very important person um, in the school environment in that area. Um, oftentimes, um, school nurses um, work together with school counselors and school psychologists. Um, but if you see here, I think that these stats are particularly interesting that by the time students get to high school, um, school nurses spend, you know, 35, between 35 and 40% of their time on um, providing some kind of mental health services to students. So, um, it's a very important role that you have is to provide, you know, emotional support to these students that are struggling. Um, and it's often overlooked by school um, administrators and other school professionals because the school nurse is, saw, is seen mostly as kind of a health provider in general, a physical health provider or um, practitioner. So for school nurses, I present the lead action plan. Um, Really, it's just something to think about as in your role um, working with students with Tourette syndrome um, in the school. It's just four areas to just check yourself on to see, you know, you know how well you're doing in these areas and what you could do to improve. So, if you're looking for some kind of, you know, professional improvement plan, you could kind of use these steps, or it's just 
could just be something interesting to look at. For the L is learn. Um, the whole idea is that you as a school nurse, it's essential that you keep learning and, and stay on top of information related to Tourette syndrome. Um, you're all very busy and have a lot of conditions to learn about in your school uh, and procedures and probably ha are swamped with paperwork on a regular basis. Um, but there's some, some easy ways to kind of keep up to date. Um, for example, you can sign up for the NJCTS newsletters. Um, they send out emails and, um, and even um, current research articles on Tourette syndrome. Um, the Tourette Association of America has um, information as well. Um, but it's very important to keep on top of these areas. The next is to educate your school community about Tourette syndrome. If you have a student that has Tourette syndrome in your school, it's very important that you get involved as much as needed. Obviously, if it's, it's someone with mild tics and they don't really need too much help, you don't have to get over involved. But it's, it's important that you provide your expertise and help out. Um, I can't stress enough right here that um, for TS students, it's essential that you can give supportive and informed counseling. Um, if you don't know that, if you don't feel comfortable talking about specifics of Tourette syndrome, just, just them knowing that you are understanding and, um, you know, are, are someone that would listen to their problems um, and hear them out and know that they're, they're struggling and, and give them support can be a big uh, bonus. Um, also, parents may have a lot of questions about um, Tourette syndrome and it's important um, you know, you might be one of the first people they ever talk to about, about ticks. You might be someone that notices it in elementary school um, when, and, and have to call them and say, you know, I think something's going on. You might want to get this checked out. Um, so provide information, appropriate referrals. Usually in the beginning, it's appropriate to just refer to the pediatrician, um, you know, but also if they, if they need more information, you can refer them to the local threat association chapter. Accommodating students' needs. Oftentimes, school nurses, it's really important that you um, can help with any kind of school accommodations that are needed, particularly often, uh, offering a safe place for students to take a break. Um, and also, also um, providing you know, support to teachers and child safety team about it. You know, they might need more information. Um, you might want to update them about medication status or um, also, you know, how students doing if you see them on a regular basis during the breaks. Um, and the last is to collect data. So really, it's important as a school nurse that you keep track of the students because you see them sometimes every day or at least they're in your building most of the time um, when they're in school. And they're, they're outside practitioners, doctors, psychologists, even their parents aren't with them all day in the school. So it's important if a kid's really struggling, if you see them to just help keep data, you know, maybe monitor the medication when they're on it, how their behaviors are after they take it, the side effects, uh, monitor when they're taking breaks, see if there's any patterns that maybe they struggle more at the end of the day. Um, sometimes, and often this information can really lead to helpful changes, maybe in medication, um, you know, dosage or timing um, or type, and also um, interventions in the school. Maybe different times of the day, um, schools will implement different interventions. So finally, here are some strategies and tips for schools and families. I just want to put this on here that oftentimes TS students have a 504 plan or they may have a 504 plan or an IP plan um, or an IP in the school. Um, if they're classified with trust syndrome, it would be under other health impaired. Um, sometimes students <coughs> might not have a formal plan. Um, maybe their symptoms aren't severe enough to impact their academics, um, but they'll still require some accommodations. Um, and really an IP, IP is often recommended when a student is having a, many difficulties and is falling behind academically. Um, okay, I include this list here. I'm not gonna go through all of them on this webinar, but it's in your slides, so you could have it if you want a reference. Um, there are, this is not exclusive, obviously. There's, there are more accommodations um, out there. Um, one that I don't think is on here is, uh, maybe I have it on here, yeah. Um, but you know, accommodations for written work, sometimes um, text-to-speech use on a tablet, like an iPad, um, for students that are having a lot of motor tics, this might be difficult for them to write. Um, and providing breaks, preferential seating are some common ones that are used in schools. So 
every student in situation is unique. If there's a really challenging student in the school and, and as a nurse, you're on part of like an INRS team or an IEP team uh, or a 504 team or just a team that's helping any student in need, um, you know, it's important to really look at every student, every situation, because every kid with ticks and Tourette's is, is an individual and different. Um, it might require um, making some kind of compromises, you know, and, and, and making accom accommodations. Um, it also might require, you know, the school conducting, you know, a type of individualized behavior plan, really looking at, um, you know, what kind of environmental factors are affecting the ticks, um, what we need to, what skills we need to work on with the student, maybe with the counselor um, and in the classroom, and, you know, how the staff should respond to the different ticks when they occur. So in general, a lot of times when I talk to professionals, they ask, you know, questions, and, and, and I think this slide is particularly helpful about how to respond to ticks. In general, when a, when a kid is ticking in front of you, be patient. Wait for them to complete their ticks. It might seem like it's taking longer than um, you're comfortable with, but just stay with it. Um, sometimes you ask a question and you might not get the response right away. Um, or, you know, a, a child might be doing their ticks and you think they're not listening to you, but they are listening to you. So being patient is important, not answering questions for them or talking for them. Um, often, it's best just to ignore the ticks, not to point them out, not to ask about them. You're not really sure, like I said before, what level of uh, identity they're at, you know, how, what their awareness is of the tick and how comfortable they feel talking about it. Um, so instead of talking about the ticks, it's particularly if a kid is disruptive in the classroom or um, you want to get them on task, it's important to just focus on other behaviors or the activity at hand. So if a kid's ticking at, while you're talking to them and you want them to, you know, get back to work, you might just go look at the book and say, hey, um, what's, what's here on this, uh, what does question three say on this, on this page right here, you know, or um, just ask them a question about some on a different activity. This is kind of a hallmark is of uh, tick 101 is don't tell them to stop. That's um, really not an appropriate thing to say to someone with ticks um, because they have a really hard time stopping. Um, using positive reinforcement with them, you know, just talking about um, anything that, that will boost their spirits um, and really listening, empathizing, and supporting them. Um, breaks in quiet time could be one of the most important things a school nurse can provide for a kid with ticks. It could be a sanctuary in a, um, the middle of the school, your, your office, the cot in your office. Um, you know, they might be struggling all day and look forward to a few minutes of just a break in your office where they can go let out some ticks um, that they've been holding in. Um, it's just important to use it uh, discreetly. So if the student's going to take a break, maybe the teacher can um, have them bring papers to your office or have some kind of keyword or something so it's not so obvious when they go um, and take a break. Sometimes kids get very upset. They don't want to take breaks because they don't want to be singled out in class. And that's actually a very common thing for kids. So it's important to do it discreetly. Just another slide kind of reinforces um, tips is to remember the factors that cause chicks, ticks to change because they do change. They wax and wane. Um, people can only hold them back for short periods of time. Environment affects the ticks. Medications um, have side effects and can affect ticks. Um, many co-occurring disorders can be um, present and could be causing symptoms. Um, but it's important to remember this because one of the biggest problems in schools in my professional experience has been um, in doing talks to different schools and working in schools is um, when in, people try to be tick detectives. Essentially, it is trying to determine if a behavior is done on purpose or is a tick. And this is not something that when I first started working um, with uh, the Tourette syndrome population that I was really um, told about or, or, or really was focused on a lot. This, this has come um, over many years of working with this population that and is highlighted as a problem that comes up often um, in families and schools. Um, basically, the, the sum of it is don't try to determine if it's a tick or not. Instead, just assume that the behavior is at least partially and possibly fully related to ticks or some kind of associated condition. Basically, whether or not it's a tick, the child has difficulty controlling some of his behaviors for a neurological reason. Because in schools, this can lead to a lot of different problems um, where maybe a, a teacher or another kid in the class believes the kid's doing it on purpose. Sometimes kids will, like I said before, say they're doing it on purpose. Um, 
even though they're probably not and they're just trying to save face because they don't want others to think that they have any kind of difficulty with controlling their behaviors. Um, and it can really lead to a lot of problems in schools. Um, okay. Um, so the big picture, just remember, symptoms wax and wane. Um, changes in symptoms are expected. Anything goes, anything could be a tick. Expect the unexpected and don't be a tick detective. Um, and overall, the most important thing school nurses can do for anyone with Tourette syndrome um, is really be a kind, empathic person in their lives who's informed about ticks. Um, that could be one of the, the most long lasting interventions you ever provide someone with Tourette syndrome. Okay, and some resources. Uh, I just put some very easy, obvious ones up here because they are often the best. Um, the Tourette Association of America and your local chapter if you're not in New Jersey. Um, and if you're in New Jersey, um, even outside New Jersey, you can check out too. Um, the NJCTS has a excellent um, resources for um, Tourette syndrome. And if you're looking for a video to show your staff or to watch, that's um, it's about a half hour long. It came out about 10 years ago. I think you can still get it on DVD for like $10 on Amazon. Um, the HBO special, I have Tourette's, but Tourette's doesn't have me, is a really good um, documentary. Um, and with that, um, this is, I have my information in the slides if anyone would like to um, you know, contact me. And time for questions. Okay, I have to take a moment to unmute myself there. All right, we have a fair number of questions, so I'm going to launch right into these, okay? Um, there was a specific question that showed up before you touched on this particular incident in a slide, but it would be great if you could maybe give a little bit more uh, direction related to this question. So the question is, how should a student with verbal tics be corrected in a class to lessen the disturbance. So again, you did touch on it, but since we had a specific question, maybe you could give a little bit more information in that respect. So Maury, can you just repeat, how should a student be what? How should a student with verbal tics be corrected in a class to lessen the disturbance? Okay, well, I would. first thing I would say is um, I would not correct their tic. Um, and it depends what the tic is. I would, I would ignore the tic and focus on what you want them to do instead. So um, it depends what the tic is. And it could be, you know, it also depends on how disruptive and severe the tic is. So um, if, I don't know if they gave you specifics, Marty, but an no. example would be, let's say a kid is just um, maybe repeating what the teacher said, echolalia, um, or just shouting something out. Um, not super loud. Um, the teacher might just really not respond to it because the teacher is modeling for the rest of the class how to how to respond to it. If the teacher looks agitated or starts telling the student to stop or reacts to it, in which you know in a way is reinforcing um, that kind of response, uh, it's going to model that for the rest of the class. So the teacher should model calm um, and really, if it's a mild tick, it's not really disruptive. You want to err more on the side of just ignore it. Um, and if it's hard to ignore, you want to go more down the continuum to where you maybe proximity control, where you're walking over to where they are in the classroom. Um, and then maybe you will just go over and ask them something specific, you know, that, that has not related to their tick, but related to the material. So maybe um, you want to um, say, hey, you know, what's going on on this, this page? Or what do you think about this topic? Um, if it's really, really disruptive to the class, then that's, and, and it's severe, then that's something that needs to be discussed with, you know, the school administrators and kind of um, have a meeting. And those are the tough situations where, um, you know, a plan might not, might need, need to be made um, for if the ticks get very disruptive, um, you know, maybe the student will work in smaller groups, maybe, um, maybe they can, maybe they can't, you know, it could be a very challenging situation for schools, but for all intents and purposes, if it's more of a mild to moderate tick, ignore and just try to um, focus on what they should be doing instead or just you could respond to them um, after they tick if it's more severe but try not to say anything about the tick like don't say stop it just say hey um, you know remember that project we were doing before you know can you tell me a little bit more about your you know it's just something to do with class that's not to do with the tick um, 
there aren't really sometimes it's a very difficult situation i'm, I'm glad someone brought up that I question because that's often um mm -hmm. one of the most difficult things that schools deal with um is our loud vocal ticks okay great thank you um i have a question about how would you differentiate between psychogenic movement disorder and t and tourette um okay um well i it would really have to be it would definitely have to be you know ruled out through a medical examination first to determine that it's it is psychogenic um and i would defer a little bit to a neurologist for that that answer usually um you know it could be very difficult to tell um sometimes it can co-occur um where you know it seems like there are um you know, non-psychogenic tics going on, um, and then other psychogenic symptoms could develop. I mean, there could be lots of, there's, there could be lots of different situations that occur. Um, and then oftentimes, you know, from, from my perspective as a psychologist, I will try to really ask a lot of questions about, um, do they feel any kind of, you know, um, if it's a tick, psychogenic tick we're thinking about, um, do they feel any kind of premonetary urge? Um, it could look different and appear different. It might not have the same kind of rapid um you know non-rhythmic movement it might be seem just like a different kind of movement that's another uh way we would um try to assess you know what the, the root cause is um and in, in reality it might or might not be treated differently from a psychological standpoint um you know it depends on the situation but um it, it can be difficult to determine and and i think it would have to be a collaboration between um like a neurologist a psychiatrist um and often, you know, if they're a psychologist who's knowledgeable about um, ticks as well. Okay, thanks. Um, could you give an example of what habit reversal and CBT may look like? Okay. Um, so habit reversal, for example, um, an individual might report that one of their ticks is, um, let's say, an arm arm jerking tick. So their right arm goes up in the air um, rapidly. And um, so really it, it can be more comprehensive than this, but I'll kind of get down to the, the nuts and the bolts of the habit reversal part of it. Um, I often like to kind of focus on um, awareness training first, which is the first component, which would involve really dissecting every part of um, what the tick looks like, what, what, what the, the tick urge um, feels like where the sensation is felt, um, and then kind of looking at some functional uh, assessment factors. You know, where does it happen more often? You know, what are some situations where you feel it the most? Um, really get all the information about uh, out about the tick, and then practice awareness training. Where you know, with an individual in a room in the clinician's office, um, you kind of would would maybe have a conversation or um, or engage in some kind of activity that would make it more likely the tick might occur. Um, and when before the tick occurs, the individual will kind of signal that they feel the tick happening. So really practicing being aware of that tick urge before it happens. Um, once that's kind of solidified, um, you would go on to um, incorporating and developing a competing response, which would be some type of, for you know, in simple terms, like an opposite movement um, that if it's made, it's really hard to do the tick. So um, for example, if the arm, the tick is the arm going up in the air, um, Compete your response might be keeping the arm down on the body and maybe like putting your hands in your pocket so you can't move your, your arm up or it makes it more difficult. And then kind of pairing the two together of being aware of the tick urge and then pairing that with not raising your arm up. And um, that's the kind of a general practice. And you would practice, usually you want to practice with a clinician and work that out um, and do a few trials in a clinician's office of, of each, you know, awareness um, plus competing response. Um, and then you would have homework and practice at home. Um, and then you kind of work together in that way. That's a really general way to describe it, but um, it works one tick at a time. And often when it works for individuals, um, in my anecdotal experience, when they come back to my office the next week, um, often are kind of nonchalant about it. It, it. And they can say, yeah, a tick that I've had for the last three months that's really bothering me. Uh, yeah, I guess it's not really happening anymore. 
it, and that's for some reason that's his response i <laughs> i get a lot is it's not like a, oh it's gone or i'm not really doing it it's more like yeah it's not really happening and then we move on to the next one um but oftentimes you know individuals in different ticks are different so um have reversal might work differently for on the same person with a different tick. It might be really, you know, not as effective or more tricky. Um, so it's not a cure all, but it's definitely something that could, could relieve a lot of individuals um, tick symptoms. Mm -hmm. it, it seems to me that it's, it, you know, so much about what goes on with TS is beyond your control. And this is one thing you can do that's, that's a positive that you feel like you can have some control. And I think that maybe plays into that. What do you think? Definitely. I think that sometimes um, once individuals learn the competing responses or the general process of how it works, um, they do feel like they have another tool to use to help manage their ticks in the moment. Um, you know, like I talked about before, a lot most individuals with ticks have uh, have their own coping strategies that they developed over time. They, they will, if you ask them, how do you manage your ticks, they'll tell you oh, for a while, I just kind of, you know, don't think about it, or I, I like a stress ball, or I chew gum. Um, and that could, that could be very helpful for someone. So the, doing habit reversal could really just give another, um, right, it could give them a sense of control, um, another tool to use. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question that we could segue right with this one, because what you've just described with, with habit reversal, um, the question is related as to what age would you recommend that? So you've got to have somebody that's ready to do this. So what age do they typically want to? Yeah, that's, that's a great reversal? question. Um, well, I think it's, it's very similar when I talked about the stages of tick identity slide where, uh, you know, you could try have wrestle with someone who's an adult and they're not really ready to do it. And you could do have wrestle with someone that's six years old and they're, they're locked into it. So I've I've successfully used have wrestle with kids about as young as five or six. Um, mm. I don't normally you know recommend a five year old doing it too much, but um, I've had one gung ho five year old once that did a great job. Um, and it really depends on the individual, and, and it's not as much dependent on the age. Um, um, you know, some people it's just it's the the way they perceive their ticks or, or experience their ticks or, or their threat syndrome is very unique, and it and it. Sometimes it lends itself to um, being more ready, willing, and able to, to engage in a, in a behavioral treatment for ticks, and sometimes it doesn't. So um, that's a good question, though. Okay. Um, I have one about medication that I'm going to ask you, and you can see how you want to handle it. Um, do any medications, namely those for ADHD, exacerbate ticks? Well, the Is there any evidence? Let me put it that way. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so I would say about or more years ago, um, as far as I'm aware, from the um, professionals I've spoken with and the, the literature I've read, um, and I think that there were some um, there were some articles and literatures out there that the stimulant medication was really not good to be paired with uh, tick disorders, that it, it exacerbated the ticks. Um, and in the last few, several years, I would say, Five years or less, I, I a lot more physicians, psychiatrists, neurologists are prescribing stimulant medication with ticks, um, and I think that it really depends on the individual. That it, it doesn't always exacerbate the ticks. Um, sometimes it might, sometimes it doesn't. So um, it's it's more common now that uh, medical practitioners will prescribe um, some type of stimulant medication for someone with ticks and ADHD, particularly the ADHD is really severe or more prominent. Um, and um, and try it out, and it, and sometimes it's very effective. Um, oftentimes, I, I would say more often than not, um, physicians will prescribe um, like an antihypertensive medication, like Intuniv, um, which also um, can be used for ADHD as well. Um, but it's it's not it can exacerbate ticks at times for some individuals, but it's not seen to be. Um, as taboo to prescribe with ticks as it was years ago, um, and a lot more physicians are um, prescribing it. I think it's the best response I can give. Okay, you know. we've gone well over. Have we got? Can you hang on for one more question? Yeah. Okay. Um, so 
my son's, this woman is saying, my son's tics are worse in the afternoon. So she's considered trying to rearrange his schedule to get his academics in the morning. But she's afraid that that would be too much stress for him and that he needs to get a break in the morning rather than a full morning of academics. So just was interested in your thoughts on that idea. Um, I, it's, I think it sounds like a very reasonable idea. I think that's extremely common, um, to rearrange, uh, schedule and add breaks, um, to make it more conducive to a child with ticks, you know, whatever would make them more, you know, put them in a better place to be present in the classroom. Um, you know, and present meaning, you know, ready to learn and, and not, um, very distracted by the ticks. So, um, but sometimes, yeah, sometimes kids resist changing their schedule and taking breaks because they, for whatever reason, it's more stressful for them. They feel singled out. Um, but it's definitely something that, that can be considered. And sometimes uh, a compromise can be figured out where maybe you can, you can add some breaks and some, a smaller change in the schedule so that a child doesn't feel, you know, as stressed about it. Um, but they're still having a chance to take breaks, you know? Um, but I think that's, I, I do think it's, a very commonly used strategy and um, it sounds like a pretty good idea from what you've you know from that information I was given okay all right well I think we've got to wrap it up here uh, dr. Hartke thank you a really great presentation a lot of good solid information we appreciate your time and I'm going to turn this back over to Kelly for a final wrap-up Thank you for joining us on our webinar on what a difference a school nurse can make, a TS guide for school nurses. There is an exit survey which we need everyone attending to fill out. The webinar blog is open now and available for the next seven days on the NJCTS website for any additional questions that were not covered in tonight's presentation. That website is www.njcts. Org. Also, an archived recording of tonight's webinar will be posted to our website. Our next presentation, the TS Puzzle, How Do the Pieces Fit Together, will be presented by Dr. Martin Franklin and is scheduled for February 21st, 2018. This ends tonight's webinar. Thank you, Dr. Hartke, for your presentation, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Good night. <laughs>